Thank you, choir members. Go. All right. Um, can you see my screen? I just want to make sure everyone can see my screen at this point in time. Um, very good. Um, I want to begin. Uh, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite hobbies um, is is um, is baking. I enjoy baking, and uh, I, I love to pay attention to the to details and and follow the recipes. Um, but you know, from time to time, uh, one of my baking creations uh, doesn't turn out exactly uh, as expected. For for example, I remember one time I was baking a cake and uh, I carefully measured and blended all of the ingredients together. I, I poured the mix into the pan. I preheated the oven and I set the timer and placed the pan in the oven. And at the end of the time. Uh, I pulled the cake out, uh, but it hadn't it hadn't risen. It was it was flat, and it was then that I realized I had forgotten one of the essential ingredients, which was baking powder. And without the baking powder, there was no nice fluffy cake. Likewise, we learned last week that without the practice of Christian love, Christianity fails. But we may wonder what love looks like. What is the nature of Christian love? How do we describe it? Well, part two of Paul's great hymn of praise to love tells us what this essential ingredient called love looks like. And I want to invite uh, Frankie at this time to read uh, the passage. So Frankie can unmute yourself and uh, read the scripture. That would be great. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Thank you, Frankie, for reading. In part two of Paul's song of praise to love, he tells us what love does and what love does not do. In total, he lists 15 characteristics, 15 actions would be the better word, seven actions that love chooses to do, and seven and, and eight actions that love refuses to do. Now, the, word, Paul, the words Paul chooses to describe these positive and negative characteristics are Greek verbs. And this is often obscured in our English translations by the helping verb to be. You know, we read love is patient or, or love is not envious. But the literal renderings of these words would be love exercises patience. Love shows kindness. Commentator Alan F. Johnson writes, he says the emphasis is not so much that love is the static quality of kindness or patience, but that Christian love repeatedly exercises kindness and patience. These habitual practices form the Christian character or virtues that in turn transform us into persons and communities that embody Christian love as their fundamental disposition attitude and expression. Now, as we survey these actions of love today, um, I invite you to consider this, this question. How does your practice of love measure up in light of Paul's praise song to love? You know, what's the balance in your love bank, so to speak? How well are you loving today? Paul's passage begins, love is patient. Love exercises patience. 
The Greek word literally means that it is far from anger, that love is long tempered. And it always refers to patience, not with circumstances, but with people. The fourth century church father, John Chrysostom said that it is the word used of those who are wronged and who have it easily in their power to avenge themselves and yet will not do it. It describes people who are slow to anger. We heard those words describing God this morning in our call to worship. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Second, love shows kindness. The concept here is undeserved generosity. And like patience, this expression of love is shown by God to us in Jesus. Titus 3, 4 says, But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Kindness, like patience, refuses to avenge. Kindness actively seeks the good of those who may be annoyances to us and our community. It's linked to compassion and forgiveness. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4, 23. Romans 12, 17 tells us what? It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. And if our enemy is hungry, we're, we're, we're to feed him. If our enemy is thirsty, we're to give her something to, to drink. In other words, we're to, we're to show kindness. Kindness. You see, the power of kindness is that it interrupts cycles of anger and resentment and violation and re, uh, violence and retaliation. Here's a story about Abraham Lincoln that illustrates the power of patience and kindness. You know, no one treated Abraham Lincoln with more contempt than his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. Stanton called Lincoln a low cunning clown. He nicknamed him the original gorilla. And he said that the traveler and explorer Paul Duchelier was a fool to wonder about Africa trying to capture a gorilla when he could have gone and found one so easily in Springfield, Illinois. In response, Lincoln said nothing. And in fact, he made Stanton his war minister because he was the best man for the job. Lincoln treated Stanton every day with courtesy and the years wore on. And then the night came when President Lincoln was assassinated. And in that little room where they took President Lincoln's body stood the same Stanton. And looking down on Lincoln's silent face, the man who had shown contempt to Lincoln said through his tears, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. The patience and kindness of love had conquered in the end. Now, having described two of love's positive actions, Paul then lists eight negative actions that love cannot do. Because to do one of these negative actions would be to nullify love. The positive actions are mutually exclusive from these negative actions. And the first one, Paul says, is that love does not envy. The kind of envy that is spoken of here is not just covetousness. It's not just wanting what someone else has, but rather it is the vice. It is the vice that doesn't, so, doesn't necessarily want what others have, but it wishes that they do not actually have what one does not have, right? It, it, it's, a, it's a wishing away of what someone else has. There's a meanness of this type of uh, envy, of this type of uh, jealousy. It, it, it's revealed in the following story. There were two shopkeepers and they were bitter rivals. They would carefully track each other's businesses. And when one made a sale, he would smile triumphantly and wave at the other shopkeeper. One night, an angel appeared to one of the men in the dream and said, I will give you anything you ask, but whatever you receive, your competitor will receive twice as much. Would you be rich? 
You can be very rich, but your competitor will be twice as wealthy. Do you wish long and healthy life? You can, but his life will be longer and healthier. What is your desire? The man pondered for a moment, and then he responded. Here is my request. Strike me blind in one eye. And it said that the angel and God wept at the man's request. Love is not envious. Further, love does not boast. It is not proud. It is not arrogant or boastful. These two negative actions are similar, but each a little different. The first reminds us that there's a self-evasing quality in love. William Barclay writes, true love will always be far more impressed with its own unworthiness than its own merit. Love is not proud. It reminds us that love does not have inflated thoughts of oneself with its own importance. The Emperor Napoleon always advocated the sanctity of the home and the obligation of public worship for others. Of himself, he said, I am not a man like other men. The laws of morality do not apply to me. See, love is not boastful. Love does not boast that the adulation and devotion of one's followers would continue even if one, one went out in broad daylight and broke the law. Rather, great people never think of their own importance. There was a man by the name of William Carey. He was a British man and he was a, a missionary. But he started off in life as a uh, cobbler, someone who repaired shoes, someone who mended shoes. Carey would go on to be one of the greatest linguists the world has ever seen. He translated some part of the Bible into no fewer than 34 Indo-Aryan languages in India. Now, when he first arrived in India, he was regarded with contempt and dislike and Someone tried to humiliate him at a dinner party, saying loudly, well, I suppose, Mr. Carey, you once worked as a shoemaker. No, your lordship, answered Carey, not a shoemaker, only a cobbler. He didn't even claim to make shoes, only to mend them. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love does not behave gracelessly. The verb here means to act ill-mannered, to display improper or rude conduct. Some translations translate it this way. They say love does not behave indecently. Now, I've known more than a few people in my life who were proud that they lacked tactfulness. <laughs> they might say to me something like, well, I just tell it like it is. And while I appreciate such honesty, I appreciate even more someone who can speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. Someone who can be tactful and gracious. Second, or another action that love does not do is love is not self-seeking. Love does not insist on its own way. William Barclay says there's two kinds of people in the world, those who always insist upon their privileges and those who always remember their responsibilities. Those who are always thinking of what life owes them and those who never forget what they owe life. Self-seeking behavior fails to consider the needs of others. And it's the opposite of the love demonstrated to us in Christ Jesus. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. And we're called as brothers and sisters in Christ to have that same mind, to look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. Then Paul says that after love is not self-seeking, Paul says love is not easily angered. And love keeps no record of wrongs. 
like patience and like kindness, these two are related to one another. Love is not easily angered because love is not resentful. Love is not irritable because love keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not keep score. You know, I'll confess, this is, this is a, one of the areas in my life where I find it challenging at times. Sometimes I have a hard time not keeping score. I've spoken of the dangers of resentment before. And in this time when political leaders in our country and across the globe are playing to a politics of resentment, we as Christians want to be sensitive to this dynamic lest we ourselves become resentful, easily angered, and lose our ability to love. You see, love does not think. Love does not dwell on. Love does not obsess what someone has done to us so that they can be punished for it. This does not mean we do not name the injury, but once it's named, we move on because that is what love does, as we'll see in a few moments. And so love does not keep score with the view for future retaliation. Lastly, Paul says, love does not delight in wrongdoing. It might be better to say love finds no pleasure in anything that is wrong. In other words, love does not delight or look forward to the misfortune of others. Right? It's not loving to delight in that juicy morsel of gossip which tells us of another's misfortune. And so instead of these eight negative actions, instead of being uh, easily angered or resentful or delighting evil, instead of that, love rejoices with the truth. Love is glad when the truth of the matter prevails. Love rejoices in the truth. Something, again, that is important for us to consider in our day. Finally, Paul brings this great hymn to love, this second part, this second verse, so to speak. He brings it to a close with four positive actions of love, four two-word affirmations. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. And love endures all things. The first and the fourth are paired as are the second and the third. One commentator argues that the sense of these words is best conveyed using four negatives. So love believes all things becomes love never loses faith. Love hopes all things means love never exhausts hope. What this pairing is getting at is that love seeks to give the most favorable interpretation truth will allow. Love believes the best. It is not unduly suspicious. Love gives others the benefit of the doubt. Psychologists and counselors will remind couples how important it is to practice positive attribution. Leadership consultants will remind pastors and leaders how important it is to practice positive attribution, to attach positive, not negative motivations to others' actions. And that's what love does. Finally, love never tires of support. Love never gives up. These words are more difficult to translate, but the idea is that love bears all things. Love endures all things. The Apostle Paul uses this word in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 12. He says in his rights as an apostle, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel. The NIV translates it as love perseveres. Love perseveres. When I think about this type of love, I think of the the story of Field of Dreams. One of my favorite baseball stories. One of my favorite baseball movies. If you know the movie, you're familiar with it. The main character, Kevin Costner, is a farmer in the middle of Iowa. And he plows up his cornfield because he's heard a voice tell him, if you build it, he will come. He's also heard the voice tell him, ease his pain and to go the distance. And Costner and his character thinks he's to do all these things. 
for Shoeless Joe Jackson, who had been banned from baseball back in 1919 after being accused of betting and throwing the World Series. But in the end, we discover that he wasn't to do it for Shoeless Joe, but he was to do it for his own father and for himself. And it's that last word, go the distance, go the distance, keep going, keep persevering because love never ceases. Love never ceases loving. And love is this way because love is of God. And everyone who, who's been born of God knows God and, and loves God and demonstrates this love and loving one another and loving their neighbor. And God went the distance for us. As, as Paul said to the Philippians, he said, Jesus went the distance when he, he went to the cross for all of humanity, for me and for you, for everyone to restore our relationship with God. So that we too can, can love, love God and to love others just as God has loved us. This morning, friends, as we've listened and as I've tried to uh, shine a little light here and a little light there on the meaning of this hymn, which can become so familiar to us that we miss uh, uh, the magnitude and the, uh, 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 the power of, of Paul's words. You, you are invited to, to measure your own love bank, your, your own practice of love. I, I know I can speak to myself and know that at times my practice of love doesn't quite measure up. And that's okay. I'm aware of that. You may be aware of that as well, but one does not need to stop loving oneself as a result because God doesn't stop loving us. God went the distance. And so we can confess the way that we missed the mark. We can seek to be reconciled with the person as Ray Kinsella was reconciled with his father. We can still play catch, so to speak. We can have that one final catch. So as you ponder that this morning, as you think about love, may you remember that you are always loved by God and God invites us to share his love with others. Amen. Our communion hymn this morning is my Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I love thee. We invite you to sing in your own home as our choir members come and lead us in the singing of this hymn. 